when I'm in this state hovering a few feet above my body, um, there is also an awareness that there is no time on the other side. And there is, it, I, can, I have access to past, present and future all at the same time. And that time only exists in this realm where I'm living in my body on earth. Because on the other side, there is not no time. And uh, I'm aware that my body is down on the table and then I, that I live in that body. It's kind of my house or my car it sort of belongs to me. There's that awareness. And shortly after that, I got sucked back in. And it's, you know, so here I'm, I'm back in my body, but... Hi, I'm Dr. Lottie Valentine, and I'm your superior self. <laughs> yes, you are. Dr. Lottie, thank you for taking the time. This is going to be such a treat. Like, I just love your energy. I love your story. I just love the inspiration that you bring for other people. Thank you for hanging out with me tonight. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. Sure. Let's give every, like, why, why, why are you here? Like, let's, let's understand the full context of the story, right? Like you have this interesting, such a powerful story and I just had to have you on, right? Like I was like, I saw an interview. I think you were on my buddy show, Alex Ferrari show. Um, and I was like, you know what? I got to I got to have her on. So why don't you give us some context, like your story. You want me to tell the story of the near death experiences or? Yeah. Yeah, or what, yeah. what I experienced. There was two, right? There was two. Right. Yeah. Um, the first one was after my third child was born. And <clears throat> she was actually born between a 7.4 and a 7.2 earthquake. So that was a moment in my life when I thought I was going to die. Because everything was shaking. They were leaning on the table to hold me down. And you know how they have those metal trays in mm -hmm. the hospital with all the little metal instruments? And they were levitating up and down and jumping up and down on the tray. And uh, the whole wall was just windows. And, you know, when, when it's shaking that much, all the power went out. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, we're going to just, just you know, be buried under the rubble. When the ceiling tiles fall in, the windows are going to crash in. But somehow the hospital managed to uh, not collapse and it was built on rollers. So it was rolling back and forth. It was one of the newer hospitals back then. So it rolls with the earthquake. And then I gave birth and then I hemorrhaged after birth. And <clears throat> it was about 10 days later, I hemorrhaged again, went to the ER, kept me for observation. They did a manual inspection. They said, oh, nothing really looks wrong. You can go home. And then I hemorrhaged again the next day. We called the hospital and <clears throat> it was decided I should just see the doctor the next morning. So I saw the doctor Friday morning and again, manual inspection, no lab work, no ultrasound, nothing. Sent me on my way. And then that afternoon, hemorrhaged again, went back to the ER. So this time they said, okay, we'll keep you for observation again. And I was lying on this table. They did a manual inspection, said nothing much looks wrong. I didn't even have a bell to ring. So this is 1992. No IVs were placed. I'm just lying there on the table. And I start bleeding again. And I think the spirit world sent this nurse to check on me because she just, at the right moment, you know, the more I think about this, how that timing of her coming to check on me at that moment literally saved my life. So she opens the door and she realizes that i am been bleeding so I'm lying in this table. It's, the papers are just soaked with blood. Um, I'm sure it was a horrific scene for mm. this poor nurse because she she opened the door and her jaw just dropped. She was just like oh, horrified. And then I heard the call on the loudspeaker, you know, OBGYN, stat to the ER. OBGYN, stat to the ER. And, you know, within a minute, this middle-aged physician came literally running full speed into the my room. And again, they did a manual inspection. And as they do this manual inspection, and I'm hemorrhaging again. And these blood clots were huge. They were larger than a man's fist, like the size of a baby's head. They were just enormous blood clots. 
So I'm trying to sit up to tell the doctor, I'm not feeling too good. And at this point, he knew what was going on and how much blood I had lost. So he just pushed me back onto the table and they they tipped the table so that my head would go towards the floor and the feet go up in the air to keep all the blood in the vital organs. And then I had um, the whole room filled with the hospital staff, but my eyes are closed at this point. So I'm just hearing all the people come in and people, you know, firing commands back and forth. And the nurse on my right is quoting my blood pressure. And the nurse on my left is trying to get an IV placed in my arm. And as they're doing this, I'm lying on the table. I feel like I'm just falling. So imagine jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. I'm just falling to the ground. That's what it feels like. And it's probably my blood pressure that's just falling at this point. And I'm just thinking, what's taking her so long? And then the, the nurse on my right, the, the blood pressure nurse, yells out, 50 over 15, hurry. And now that's a blood pressure that's below supporting heart rate. So now I'm getting really close to, you know, death and going into shock. And so I'm thinking, what's taking this nurse so long? Why can't she get that IV in? But when you go into shock, your veins collapse. So it's really hard to get in. So she's struggling. And it was shortly after the nurse <clears throat> yelled out my blood pressure. And she says, you know, 50 over 15. And it's shortly after that, that I realized that I'm dying. And it's so different from the experience I had during birth, during the earthquake, when I thought I was going to die. So a lot of us have been in situations where we think, oh my gosh, I, you know, I'm going to die. I'm on an airplane that's falling out of the sky, or I'm close to being in a car accident. And, but that's a different feeling when you have, I think I'm going to die versus I knew I was dying at that point. So I'm lying on this table and I'm a complete atheist. I don't believe in the afterlife. I don't believe, uh, you know, in soul survival. I don't believe in angels. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in anything. It's a complete, uh, my worldview was very scientific and materialistic. I thought you die, it's black, you're gone. That's it. So here I am lying at the table. And what do I do? I pray to God to save my life because I have nothing else left now. I know I'm dying. Is there fear so at I, all? Huh? Is there fear at all? Like, is that? Yeah, I have tremendous you... fear at this point because I knew I was dying and I don't believe in soul survival or anything. So it's, I'm going to die and this is it. And I, I was pleading with God and I said, I have three children under the age of six. My boys were six and three and a half. And then my newborn girl. And, you know, I'm just praying that there's something out there, even though I didn't believe in it. And it was shortly after that, that I just got sucked out of my body. And it's, happens very quickly because one millisecond you're inside and the next millisecond you're not. But the interesting part is when I'm outside my body, the, my first thought was, how can I be outside my body and still be me? Because hmm. it's not supposed to be this way. I, it, it went against all my beliefs. But then there is there's, there's um, complete calm and peace and unconditional love. There, there's no pain. It's You're just kind of in a bliss state. Though I was still in the ER in this near-death experience, which is very different from my second when I go out in the universe somewhere. But um, I'm when I'm in this state, hovering a few feet above my body, um, there is also a, an awareness that there is no time on the other side. And there is, it, I, can, I have access to past, present, and future all at the same time. And that time only exists in this realm where I'm living in my body on earth. Because on the other side, there is not no time. And uh, I'm aware that my body is down on the table and then I, that I live in that body. It's kind of my house or my car it sort of belongs to me. There's that awareness. And shortly after that, I got sucked back in. And you know, so here I'm, I'm back in my body. But that next morning, so I'm still in the hospital. I'm lying in my hospital bed and I'm trying to understand what happened the day before because I didn't have any beliefs of that this would even be possible. So I'm thinking, you know, what's happening? Am I hallucinating? What was that? What, you know, how do I explain that? And the nurse came and she said, oh, did anything unusual happen yesterday? You know, just any unusual experiences. So this nurse obviously knew about near-death experiences, though I had never heard of them. 
but I was petrified of telling her that my experience because I figured she was going to lock me up in the mental ward, right? Because it didn't resonate with my own beliefs at that time. And then when I'm lying in the bed, I could hear my sister-in-law in the corner of the ceiling, the left corner of the ceiling. And she said, everything's going to be all right. And she had just passed away 10 days earlier um, from lung cancer. And so now I'm even more confused because now I'm hearing the spirit world. And I thought it was outside the body, you know, that day before. And it wasn't until I told my mother-in-law she came to help because I was so sick afterwards. And I, she said, you know, what happened during that? Because she could tell there was something I was just thinking about all the time. So I told her and she said, oh, you had what's called a near-death experience. And she went out to the bookstore and she got me the book Life After Life by mm -hmm. Raymond Moody. And then I started to feel more sane because then I understood that was some kind of an experience that I had had. But then I got really sick. So I had something called bone marrow suppression. And that is something that you can actually get just from being pregnant. It's called idiopathic aplastic anemia. And it means that you're not making enough red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. So your poor immune system, you bruise very easily. You're exhausted because you don't have enough red blood cells to carry the oxygen. So I was really sick. And so two years later, as I'm in this process of healing, and I can't even, um, you know, I'm past, like, I'm constantly feeling like my soul is going to leave. So it's, the soul just leaves my body and it goes back in. So it's this constant movement of the soul. If you ask me today, I would say I'm just one piece. Like I, I was when I came to this earth. I'm just, it's just me. It just feels like it's all one. But for all those years, it was a good six years. It was just constantly separating. And I would, you know, just tying my children's shoes, putting my knee on the floor. I would get a big bruise on my knee just because I had so little blood in my body. So as I'm going through this struggle to heal, I have another near-death experience, which you could call uh, a near-death experience or a, a, no, an NDE, or you could call it an STE, which is a spiritually transformative experience. And I struggled for years about the second experience. The first experience was easy to explain. I was in the ER. I have proof. There were doctors there. There were nurses there. And, you know, I was just so scientific. And I had heard many stories. My dad was a physician, so I grew up with medicine in my household. But uh, it was really hard to um, put the second one in the cat in the same category first because it happened at home in the middle of the night. And I'm going to tell you what happened in a, in, a, in a minute. But in the end, it doesn't matter what we call the experience. You know, a near-death experience, many people think you have to be dead or clinically dead. It's not true. Most near-death experiences happen when you're very close to death. You are still, your body is still sort of alive. <laughs> you're not clinically pronounced dead. And spiritually transformative experiences are very similar to near-death experiences. And not, they can happen to somebody that's not sick at all. But they might have a very similar experience that I'm going to tell you about when I went out into the universe. So... Anyway, it doesn't matter what you call the experience. It is what happens inside of you as a result of that experience, how it changes you. So the second experience happened in the middle of the night. And I would often wake up, you know, my head is pounding because I had so little blood in my body. And uh, I would always feel like, you know, hold on to my soul. Don't leave. We can't, you know, we got to stay here. And that happened again in the middle of, in the, middle of the night. And I wake up and I put my legs up, you know, trying to keep my soul. We can't leave. We can't leave. We got to stay here. But again, just like in the ER, it, it my soul just got sucked out. And it's in a split second, you're outside the body. But this second experience is very different because I tumbled through darkness. So imagine like a spaceship in Star Wars, like you're going flying through space. That was the feeling like I was tumbling through space. And, you know, are we really tumbling through space or are we just here the whole time, right? This is just the perception of, of that out there. But it doesn't really matter because it's just how we interpret it all. So I have this perception of tumbling through space and I get to this place that I call the mid station because um, I had an awareness that you could go higher, but I also had an awareness that there were floors below me. So if you step into an elevator of a skyscraper and you push the 50th floor, you know that there are 50 floors above you, 
right? And 50 below you or 49. Um, but there is an awareness that you could go higher or you could go lower. So I call it the bouncing station because they sent me back. It's almost like you get here, but you can't go any further because we got these guards up here that's going to say, no, 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 you can't stay. Oh, you can stay. You know, it's kind of like a cartoon in a way, but that was uh, the sensation of that experience. So I get to this place and I hear the most beautiful music. And this music is more beautiful than any music you can make on the earth plane. And as I'm listening to this music, I see a log cabin to, and I look to the right and I open the log cabin because I'm thinking the music must be coming from there, but it's empty. So then I look to the left, I see a mirror image of the log cabin on the right. And I open and I look inside and it's empty. But then as I'm in here and I'm listening to this um, just incredible music, there is a growing light that comes from behind me, almost like a fog moving in, but it's just a, a pure bright white light. And as I turn around into this light, there is an outline of angels in the light and the music is coming from the angels. But I also have an awareness. I don't believe in angels. Why am I seeing angels? And the music is coming from these angels. So it's really fascinating because it really went against my own belief system, all the, the things that I experienced. But this light, that is, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it God. You can call it source. Or if you have some other name, it doesn't matter what you call it. But that is what we come from. That is source. That is the creator. And that light is, it's just pure, unconditional love. And we are part of that light. We come from that light. We return to that light, you know, when we leave the earth plane. And, you know, we all carry that light within us. We are part of that light. We are all, we are all connected through the light. We're all one in the end because we all come from that source. And we're all just a reflection of each other in this earth plane. Mm -hmm. so as I am in this light I become aware of two spirit guides and the, they're communicating with each other so the one on the right communicates with the one diagonally to the left in front of me and he says what is she doing here she can't be here she has to go back this is why I call it the bouncing station so I say wait a second how can I be how can I be me how can I be outside my body and still be me because this has been on my mind for two years already this is not supposed to happen. So what do you mean right? me? Like your personality, like your awareness? Me, yes, me, who, like the person I am without my body, I'm still that person without my body. So I'm still me. I'm still, you know, it would just be you except your body. You're just out, you're, the body is down there, but you're still there. Mm. Like you just don't have your the essence, body. Like your essence, like you're what yeah, you think you are, right? Like your Yeah, your whole consciousness, everything about you is still there. You're just outside the body. The body is just this thing that animates who we are. It's mm. it's like our car. <laughs> we're, now, were you aware of like the, yeah, car? Um, were you? Could you see another form, like a light body, or did you have hands? Did you have feet? Did you have? Were you just a point of consciousness? Just a point of consciousness, um, like formless. So I didn't have, even though I rotated in space, right? I'm rotating to the left and the right. I'm rotating in space, but there is not to my knowledge, any body or any forms like that. And the beings, they, not that I can remember, didn't have a form either. They were just entities that telepathically communicated with me. And when I said, well, how can I be outside my body and still be me? The spirit guide on my left says, well, if I told you, you wouldn't remember, but you will remember this. And then it was almost like a movie screen just sort of appears out of nowhere. And it's like I'm standing on the moon looking down on the earth. But around the earth, there is what I call the silvery glittery fishnet because it was this like diamond shaped net that went around the earth. But it was I had like um on the different nodes of the net that would be like a glitter, like a glittery like a, just glittering so like a glittery diamond or think of something like that um around the net and the spirit guide said that everything on earth is connected to each other but everything on earth is connected up to this grid hmm. and then with that i got sent back to earth but that is also 
what has driven a lot of my work and what it, what it is that I do today is that interconnectedness because um, I see it all the time. I work, you know, with so many different things and we can talk about that in a minute and ancestral healing, but that interconnectedness um, and that grid, but back in, this was in 1994. So there was no internet to Google the grid. Now you can Google the grid around the earth and you can see all these different, you know, grids around the earth. But yeah. back then there was, we didn't have an internet. I combed the San Francisco library for years trying to find any book that would explain time. And I remember reading like Stephen Hawking book on time, all those physics equations <laughs> and trying to understand why is there no time on the other side and trying to find anything that could explain to me what this grid was, but could not find anything. And so after 12 years, I gave up. And during these 12 years, um, that's when the, my spirituality and awakening to um, the spirit world and hearing the spirit world and seeing events uh, before they yeah. happened and things like that. Well, I, how did you reintegrate, right? Like after having this, these two near death experiences and then having this knowledge, I, I'm assuming you gained some type of remembering when you were outside of your body speaking to your spirit guides. It's so weird how we, I, I immediately have a vision of a spirit guide. Like I, I, you, you talk about you being a point of consciousness and you have this awareness of entities around you. Like I automatically, because of my human programming, think a body or something, you know what I mean? Like I, I envisioned guides to be people or forms or, you know, just listening to other people's stories. I immediately think of uh, somebody with a body, right? Like it's so weird, but to think that, you know, what, what are we really, if we're just consciousness, then it would be, it would make sense that we are just points, right? And to, to be able to telepathically communicate with those uh, because they don't have bodies, right? Like we wouldn't have lips to move. We wouldn't be able to have a voice. Like it's energy, right? Like com communicating amongst each other. But if, but if we're automatically, not automatically, but if we're all interconnected, then it, be, it would be easy to communicate with someone. Right. So when you communicate with the spirit world, then you communicate telepathically. So the spirit world knows everything about us, <laughs> right? Because they hear our thoughts. So when you communicate, when I work as a medium, I communicate telepathically with the spirit world. So the spirit world, depending on your way, because you're in your body. So we're so limited because we're, we're stuck in this dimension. Is that the veil though? Is the body the veil? You know, like. Maybe, maybe it's like, maybe it's the veil. Once you're outside, you, you understand how everything works in a different way. Um, but when you communicate with the spirit world, you know, different people communicate in different ways. Some people see images, some people hear things, some people feel things. So it depends. And everybody has their preference, sort of. Um, I would say probably 80 or 90 percent of my communication is through images. So I see images. But then sometimes I'll hear things and sometimes I'll feel things depending on what it is that they're trying to get across. But we it, no one way is not better than another. You know, all all different mediums, you know, some people will only hear, some people only feel, some people only see. And it's just how we are as people, you know, when it, we it's just when a we tool, connect. right? It's just a tool to connect with the other side or or mm -hmm. with um the other it, some people call it spirit world, um the one consciousness, whatever you want it's just semantics. Um, but I feel like I can connect um through visualization right and hearing um i sometimes like you know i'm still discerning whose voice that is right like is it my programmed voice that i've heard throughout my life or is it really information and i think there's techniques that you can use to, to test that right like to see what um what information you're getting whether it's like your own little ego making that up or if yeah. it's actually <laughs> something else higher than yeah. yourself yeah, when I when I learned, um, so like for 12 years, I started seeing things and hearing things and this, hearing the spirit world. So after I went to med school in 2012, I graduated in 2016, I was guided to go to Arthur Finley College in England, who is a renowned school for psychic sciences. So the, like the most famous mediums, I think, in the world probably studied at Arthur Finley. Or I, I know the ones I know about that are very famous mediums, they all studied there. So um, anybody who is, you know, interested in exploring 
exploring that, go to arthurfindley.org. They are about an Giesman hour. Went there, right? Huh? Suzanne Giesman, did she go there? Yeah, Suzanne Giesman went there. Yeah, yeah I went there many Dr. times. Dr. Lottie went there, the famous, yeah, Dr. Exactly. famous Dr. Lottie. <laughs> and when you go there, they will teach you. You will learn where it's coming from. Is that information coming from my brain or is it coming from somewhere else? And it's just a, it's, it's like a sorting, it's like a sorting toy, you know, the toddler sorting toys, <laughs> like circle, square, triangle. You're just learning to sort that information. And it's just in the beginning trial and error, because you might not be aware you're getting information, but you might not yet know where it's coming from. And I thought the first time I was there, it took me a good two days. You know, when I would say she would, the teacher would say, okay, pair up, we're going to do, you know, practice now. And we would, you know, do a reading for each other and I would get things right. And I would just think it was just luck. It was just pure luck. I, it can't be, can't be. Even though I had had all these experiences and knew when people were going to die and people visiting me that had passed away for 12 years, I was still doubting that you could bring in a spirit for somebody else. But after two days of getting information right, I realized, okay, it's not luck. <laughs> so it, it, you know, we're actually communicating. You're communicating with people, with a spirit world for people that you have never met that could be from any country in the world. Because people come from all over the world to study. You know, I work with somebody that might be from Australia. The next person I work with is from Austria. The next person is from South Africa. The next person is from Greece. The next person is from Canada. So people are from all over the world. You don't know anything about these people. And you have to pull in a spirit that belongs to them and then say something that they recognize about that person. So when you go through this training, you realize okay, this is, it would be impossible to make it up, just impossible. Mm. So I know after, because in the beginning, you might not be aware where the information comes from. Now I know the information that comes from my brain or if it comes from the spirit world, right? You learn to sort out the way that information comes in. Well, what about learn, entities, yeah. right? Like what, or, or spirit guides, you, can you discern which is from your spirit guide or a lower form of vibration or something that is, that is a ascended master or source. Can you, can you figure that out for yourself? What, what bits of information you're receiving and from who? Right. So if you're working, um, with or is someone, it intentional, right? Is it, yeah. or is it your intention? Yeah. I mean, it depends. Um, it depends how the information comes in, but most of the time you will know, you will know if it's a spirit guide, or you will know if it's a, like a family member because it's just the way that energy shows up. Um, and the, for for those things, I typically feel it. So I would say this is a, this is somebody close to your family. I can feel the the warmth, the the loving energy from this person. And you know, this was a you know, this is like a brother or a child, for example. And you just you know figure out who it is and saying this is um this is um. A person that died in a car accident and it's, it's a teenager and it's a young man. And I believe it's your child. Does, does, does that resonate with you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we know who, who it is. Cause you know what I'm saying? You can't make it up or you have, um, you know, this feels like a partner or a husband, like a boyfriend or a husband kind of like a, so there's different feelings cause they show the, for me, they show the feelings. So that's how I sort that out. But for somebody else, they might be, I know that somebody told me at Arthur Finley the College, she said, I said, how do you know if it's like an aunt or an uncle? How do you get it so precise? I was just starting out. And she said, oh, I always I ask them to line up in a certain way. So if they stand on the right of the main spirit or to the right of the person I'm talking to, then I know it's a family member. If it's on the left, I know, you know it's on the father's side. Or mm -hmm. she had this whole sorting system and she sure. would just ask the spirit to be in a certain spot and then she would know how you know that person related back oh wow, that's fascinating yeah it is fascinating because it's just a way of communicating right sure. with them and if you can't hear what they're saying in the beginning you're you're just sort of floundering mm -hmm. but as you're going through and you're getting trained you learn to say okay i can't hear you i need to come closer okay i'm not understanding show me that again um, you know, so sometimes I'll have an, see an image three times and I'm like, okay, this seems crazy because you're thinking this person is going to think I'm nuts. I'm going to talk about pineapples now. Or, <laughs> you know? And then it'll be, yes, we had our you know honeymoon in Hawaii and everything was pineapples. So th those things come through very clearly. Um, 
Well, what about yeah. medical school, right? Like, yeah. did you have these gifts and experiences when you were going through, through medical school? Cause I know you kind of went later in life, right? Like, and if you did, like, did you have issues with like the way that they were training you in a traditional clinical setting where you're like, man, this just doesn't, this just doesn't work, right? Like, let, let's, let's change the paradigm here. Let's start being more holistic and listening to the body more. And let me use my gifts here to connect with a higher consciousness. So that way I can really truly connect with this patient. Uh, no. Or did that come later? <laughs> that, I guess that came so, later, maybe. I wish. But med school is med school. And so it's very different. Um, med, you know, the, I went to naturopathic medical school, but the first two years are very similar to traditional medical school. It's all biochemistry and nine months in cadaver lab and physiology. And then when you get into the second two years, then you get into the clinical stuff and you start entering, going in on shift and seeing patients. But med, medical school practicing medicine under your license is all about doing what they were taught, what they taught you in medical school. You have, it's all evidence-based. So you have to prove what's wrong with that patient. You know, you do an intake and, sure. you know, then you decide what's Diagnosis wrong with the patient. So what are the labs? Reimbursed. Yeah. Right. You got to code it. You got to prescribe medication and it all has to be charted in a specific way because there are, you know, charts are like legal documents and um, all that. So what's your, so what's your thoughts on, what's your thoughts on diagnoses now, right? Like, do you, as your philosophy has changed, as your experience has changed, right? Like, are you still the same doctor that you were back then? When I was in med school? Uh, no. <laughs> so when you're in med school, you have to do everything exactly the way you're taught and you're uh, practicing medicine under the physician that is in charge of your, in charge of your shift. So you can't do anything. You can't even tell a patient to drink water. You're not allowed to do give any kind of advice without the physician in charge of you um, saying that, that that is okay to say because you're not fully educated yet and you don't know. It seems innocent to tell somebody to drink water, but that could be something that's not good for that patient and you haven't learned all those things yet. So when you're in med school, you have to do everything that the doctor on the shift is like, it's like a TV show, you know, house or something. They go around the table and they'll say, okay, everybody, what would you do with this patient? You know, some each, each person has to present the case of that patient. And then everybody has to chime in and say, I would do this. I would do that. And you can't say something somebody else already said. So when you're number 10 out of those 12 people on shift, you're thinking, okay, shoot, they already <laughs> mentioned, they already mentioned that medication. You already mentioned that supplement. What else can I do? And so it keeps you, it really keeps you on your toes. Um, so it's, you know, it's a very high stress being in med school uh, because it's it's just very much like a TV show at times. We carried 32 credits, I think, in 11 weeks. Wow. So that's pretty, you know, that's like doing four years how of college did, in one year. How did you do that, right? Like you had kids, right? Or I think uh, so. My kids were grown at that point. So they yeah. had all, they were all moved out. Okay. So you had some free time, <laughs> but there were people, there were people that had still had kids at home. I don't know how they, they, they looked so tired. Uh, I don't know how I, they did it. I know. Um, well, how's your practice had. changed, right? Like how do you have a practice now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so like looking at the two, um, from your past and to right now, like how has it changed since you started out as a young, uh, physician to where you are now more experienced? Yeah, it's changed quite a bit. So first of all, I work, I, I split my time. Uh, so I work half 50% of my time, I work as a physician and 50% of my time, I work spiritually with people. Because I have that understanding that in order to heal, first of all, there, you can't just heal with somebody by giving them a medication, you can control somebody's symptoms. So Western medicine is built on, let's get the pain level down, let's give you this medication. But it's not like it heals. Typically, it doesn't heal a person. It controls the the symptoms that the patient has. But um, in order to heal somebody, you really have to work with them emotionally and spiritually. So I work in my spiritual business as ancestral healer, medical intuitive, uh, which I, I love because I just know things about people. And it, that started in med school where I would just know what was wrong with the patient, you know, when the, before they even opened their mouth. So now I work as a medical intuitive uh, in my spiritual business, and I can help a lot of people that 
have been misdiagnosed. Many times people are sick for years, like for 10 years, and people are misdiagnosed. And it's not, um, it's not that the doctor is a bad doctor. Many times it's because the doctor isn't aware. We don't get that training in med school. So I have a lot of weird knowledge that a lot of physicians don't have. Um, so I work with um, like mold toxicity. I'm trained, I'm certified in I'm a mold doctor and people have uh, a lot of weird symptoms. And it turns out, you know, they lived in some cheap apartment in college and it had mold in the shower. And now they got all these weird mold symptoms, you know, and how do you get that out of the body? Uh, but also just in general, a lot of different people that I work with on the medical intuitive side um, and to help these people find the right physician, you know, depending on where they live. Sometimes, you know, I work with people from all over the world. So I'll have to say in your country <laughs> or in your state, you know, find a doctor that does this because that's the person that knows is going to be able to help you. But sometimes a lot of people just fall through the cracks all the time. And I would say a lot in the United States, because the way we have built our Western medical system, people don't the doctors don't have enough time to spend with the patient. And also we don't get that kind of training. There's a lot of things we don't get trained on in med school. Um, and those are the things we don't have great tests for, right? Because we have to test, we have to prove that it's something wrong, but when we don't have good tests available, we can't prove that something is wrong. And so these people fall through the cracks and they're told, well, I don't know, it's all in your head or they're given an antidepressant because they've been there five times and the doctor is the, I don't know what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so sure. many times I get a lot of those people in my medical intuitive side. And for some reason, I will know what's wrong with them because I think that's how the spirit world works. Somebody will hear me talk on a podcast and all of a sudden there's something that resonates with them. And they say, I got to see this person. And then invariably, I'll, you know, there'll be something that comes up. Oh, I know what it is. So it's fascinating. Is there a commonality? And I work a lot with like, ancestral healing too. Hmm? Sorry. Is there a commonality that you see in people, like especially now, like when they come to see you, like, is there something that sticks out? Uh, maybe it's energetically or uh, maybe not necessarily mold, but like you're feeling um, like there is a common ailment that is popping up in people that is specific to the times that we're going through right now. Uh, I wouldn't say it's specific to the times. It's just specific to uh, falling through the cracks of the medical system. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, nervous system dysregulations, um, menstrual issues that fall through the cracks, uh, endometriosis, um, um, you know, mold, Lyme, um, all so different a variety of things. Yeah, right? a variety like, yeah. of different things, or it could just be something general. Sometimes it turns out to be ancestral. So That's when you start, fascinating. yeah, you about, like, like, give me an example of that. Yeah. So ancestrally, so when we think, so everything is connected, right? And we are so much more connected to our ancestors than we think we are. I used to think, well, I never met my grandpa. So how can I be connected to him? I don't, I never, you know, I don't know anything about him really, but we are, and we're way more connected than we think. And Everything that happens, so you see all the different patterns within families too. Patterns repeat within families. The father is an alcoholic, and now the daughter daughter hates dad for being an alcoholic, but she marries a man that also becomes an alcoholic. And these patterns, we see these patterns. And I get interested in, actually get interested in the ancestral healing when I was working as a medium. I think the spirit world just has, you know, they lay out our life. And we do things in a certain order, but it's really much more planned than we think. I think at times because everything falls, it's like puzzle pieces. You'll just lay a puzzle piece every five years. Okay, next puzzle piece. But um, I was doing mediumship readings and I did like three or four readings in a row that were almost identical. And I said, it was always the same pattern. I have your grandmother with me. Your grandmother had a really hard life. She, she uh, you know, she's depressed. She's beaten up and you're... Um, grandfather was abusive. He was physically abusive towards her. He also abused the, the children. And one of those children was your mother, because I see her. And the, the client says, yes, that's correct. And then I go on and I say, now I see your mother. Your mother married your father. Your father was also abusive and he hit, he hit your mom, but he also hit you. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And so, and then I did three or four of these in a row. And then I came across um, Mark Wolin, who wrote the book, 
It didn't start with you. And he is, I think he's the, is the founder of the like constellation, family constellation therapy, something in San Francisco. I can just look him up, Mark Boulin. Um, and so then I studied under Mark Boulin with about 200 other physicians and counselors from around the world. It was actually during the pandemic. And we you know, had to work with each other and then learn the patterns of um, ancestrally in, inheriting uh, different traumas. But that the traumas that we inherit, we inherit from being in the environment, right? So there's certain patterns, the way we react and act. So it's it's the actions and reactions and interactions of your ancestors that is unresolved. So think of it like unresolved trauma of the past that gets passed down because it's unresolved. And there's so there are certain patterns that are that repeats the way we interact with that, but also it's passed down on the DNA. So we know that trauma is passed on the DNA. And when you think about it, almost all of our grandparents and great grandparents were in war, right? They're, it's almost un unavoidable, the whole world. Mm -hmm. But the, those uh, traumatic events are passed down genetically, and they already know uh, a couple of the genes, the FKBP5 gene is one of them. And they know that it can transfer down to grandchildren because they uh, did research on the Holocaust survivors. And they can see that um, those there are certain gene markers that are affected. And they did studies on, um, there's a great study that was done in 2013, which was called Epigenetic Inheritance of Ancestral Odor Fear Conditioning. Hmm. And it was published in um, Nature Neuroscience, I believe. And it was a study that was led by Brian Diaz at the Emory University School of Medicine. And they took uh, male mice and they would expose them to cherry blossom smell. And every time they smelled the cherry blossom, they would give them an electric shock. And so, of course, these mice learned to fear the cherry blossom smell. And then they took the sperm from this male mice and they artificially inseminated the female mice. So the female mice never even met the male mice. They just took the sperm, made the female mouse pregnant. The female mice has little baby mice. The baby mice fear the cherry blossom smell or the way that you know, it's more jumpy around the cherry blossom smell than any other smell. But not only that, they also figured out that the, there was a specific receptor called the M71 receptor that they have that got upregulated. And so these baby mice had more of the M71 receptor so they could detect the cherry blossom smell at even lower levels. So now, so they were like hypervigilant, you know, for the cherry blossom smell because that can kill you. But that got transferred on the sperm from the male mice down to the children. But think now of your grandfather that was in war. What did he experience? What was his fear? Every time the airplanes flew over, he thought he was going to die. And now the grandchild has a fear. You know, every time they see an airplane or they hear an airplane boom or they hear a siren, now they have this anxiety and panic attack, but they never had an experience themselves that could have created this reaction, right? The fear mm -hmm. that they had from their own experience. So it's coming from somewhere. So when you're working with ancestral healing, um, you have to de you know, detangle the, the patterns of, well, did the person experience this themselves? Where that person, let's say you have a fear of sirens, were you in a car accident as a child and you had a fear of sirens, you, you lost your mom, right? You had this whole trauma experience yourself. But if there's no trauma there, then what's causing you to be afraid of that siren? And then you start looking at it and then you realize, oh, it's coming from somebody else. But it could be anything that happened and it's the unresolved trauma or actions and reactions. It could be a grief pattern. You know, your grandmother had tremendous grief because uh, she did something and, you know, she lost a child in a fire and she blames herself because she forgot to turn off the lantern or the stove or, you know what I'm saying? And that child died. So there's tremendous grief and we never talk about it. The family never talks about it. It's hidden underneath the carpet, right? Mm -hmm. Sweep it under the carpet. We don't talk about it. And it's those reactions, it's, it's those events that get passed down. So it's the unresolved 
trauma and grief of our ancestors, that their fears and wrongdoings that gets passed down what and we think we're lives? independent, but we're really not. Yeah. Well, what about past lives? Do you think that's passed down too? I think, yeah, I think we have a big bag with us. <laughs> <laughs> we come in, we got our own seed bag. I call it the seed bag, the little bag of seeds that I, that I collected in all my previous life. I came in with that seed bag in this life. So I have all the seeds from my previous lives and all the learnings from my previous life. So I got all those seeds with me so I can plant them in this life. And, and then I have all my new experiences that go along with my, my own seed bag that I brought in. So I think that it's a combination of, you know, our own past lives. It's not, it's never a straight and simple <laughs> answer. We try to make it so simple, but it is so, and Complex, like, yeah. yeah, it's so in, like, we're so entangled with each other and our, even our own lives. So our, our own life and our ancestors' life, and do we come back in soul families? Is it, you know, are we around the same people over and over to make things sure. right? Well, how many times do you think you and I have had this conversation? I mean, um, that's pretty trippy to think about, right? Like in this reality, like this simulation, like how many times have I gotten to a point, right, like in my life where, uh, where I've passed all the tests in the simulation or have I not passed the tests and I just, I get to a certain point and then it restarts, right? Like to think about that, that, that to me is pretty in intense, right? Like, um, will we ever know the truth? I don't know. I think each truth is very subjective. I think each experience is very subjective. I think your truth is your truth, right? What, what you experience in your near death is your truth, but there's so many different variations of near-death experiences to different people right and people come back and they talk about it and i love listening to them because it's like oh well that's crazy like i've never heard of that before but who's who's here to say that that's wrong right people some people experience jesus some people experience their spirit guides some people experience buddha and yogananda and the sun and different uh entities but i think it's unique to the individual and i think um I think the message is very unique, right? Like you're, did you, did you receive like a purpose? Like uh, this is your lesson. Like you're, you haven't learned this yet. Like you need to go back and learn this. No, they just sent me back. <laughs> no, they said, no, get out of here. What are you doing right. here? They just said, no, you can't be here. You have to go back. But that was the message that everything is, you know, connected and we're all connected to each other, which it took me a good 25 years to understand how are we connected to each other? Well, we are connected through the universal consciousness, number one, global consciousness. And um, you know how they have the global consciousness studies. Um, I think it's out of Princeton, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, we are part of the global consciousness. And we tune into that. Um but you know we're we're all connected in all different ways then we you know we resonate and entrain with each other we resonate with the plants the animals you know we co-regulate our nervous systems with each other sure so we we're constantly synchronizing but we are also you know connected through time and space that is invisible so if you the people that won the nobel prize in 2022 for so this last nobel prize the, there was three physicists. I don't know if you know, I forget what their names are, but they proved the non-locality of photons. So if you have two photons that meet and one photon goes to Australia and the other photon goes to Europe, those photons have met. And whatever happens to the photon over in Australia is going to affect the photon in Europe because they are now entangled. And they, let's say they have photon babies. So they have photon babies and the babies are now entangled with each other. What happens to the ones in Australia is going to affect the ones in Europe, even though those photons have never even met, but their parents met. And so they are entangled. And they just proved this in physics, the, that entanglement. So now think of that as for us as human beings and consciousness yeah. and entangled with our ancestor. Are we, you and I, entangled now? Yeah, because we met. So now we're going to be forever connected. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> exactly. We got this like invisible string that got stuck on you. That's right? Everything, everybody you meet, you're, yeah, it's like this huge spider web. Everybody, you know, everybody you meet, oh, connected. And then so I'm we're sharing, you. sharing consciousness forever, you and I. So I can tap yeah. into that, 
that glorious consciousness that you have and feed from that or maybe receive guidance or inspiration in a certain direction of my life? Possibly. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> but we are all, you know, we're all part of the global consciousness. We all, they've done experiments with that and they can have people, you know, sit in a different country, a group of people and think of changing the pH of the water in the sure. lab in somewhere in the United States. And that pH, the water, that pH in that glass will change because they're focused on that. And so we know the power of the mind is way more than we think it is. Mm. I love that. Well, your mind is definitely powerful. I mean, to go through med school, to go through, um, I don't want to call it psychic school, medium, psychic medium, mediumship mm -hmm. school in England and to come out and to have your own practice and to study consciousness. I think that takes a lot of courage because it definitely goes against the grain of society. Um, have you like with your experiences, have you ever been, um, uh, nervous to express your experiences to people especially in the in the field of whatever um your certifications are in um you know to go against some of the theories that are out there and say hey no let's look at this a little bit more let's because like I, for me like i am very spiritual and like when i'm in school for psychology like i have this you know obviously it's it's to your point it's it's very um, it's very, uh, it's scientific, right? Like everything has been studied, everything has been, you know, supported with literature. And so to think about, uh, existentialism where it's very subjective to the individual is like, oh, that's not science, man. That's like, that's their own, you know, that's subjective. Like it doesn't support anything. So have you ever come against that? Right. Like in your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Cause I was one of them once before I had my own. <laughs> well, we're experience. one with everything now, right? I okay. was like that. So I get it. I understand why they would think that or why would they would be skeptical because that's who I was myself. And it's yeah. very, I think it can be hard unless you're a spiritual person or seeking the truth of our existence. I think it's very hard to tune into that if you haven't had an experience yourself or somebody that maybe is close to you. Because I know how... Um, black and white my own world was before I had these experiences and sure. I know you can't so there are people I mean if I went to a medical conference and I stood up on stage and I shared my experience probably half of them would be you know saying oh wow that's amazing thank you so much for sharing and the other half would say she's an absolute lunatic why does she have a medical license <laughs> right because they have no belief in that they don't they don't believe in anything just like I didn't Sure. And I understand that. I know it's it's hard to change people's minds. Yeah. Dr. Lottie, I could talk to you. Like, you're going to have to come back on. Like, I didn't, like, I, this went by so quick and I didn't get to ask some of the questions that I wanted to. But um, where can people find you? Where can they connect? Uh, just go to drlottie.com. So D R L O T T E.com. Mm. And everything is on my website there. My book is on Amazon. It's called Med School After Menopause, The Journey of My Soul. And it's a book about helping other people transform their life and follow their own path and um, talks about the how my mediumship came about, talks about my two near-death experiences, has my most embarrassing moment in my life in that book, which is a really funny story. Um, yeah, it is probably your worst fear. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's, that happened. That happened to me. And the story of being on an airplane that fell out of the sky. How did we not one talk about it? Faster movies, you know, like, it's like whenever so he flies right in the now. cabin. Yeah, yeah, I was on one of those planes too. So I don't know. It's been an active life. <laughs> You're coming back on again, and we're talking about that. I promise you that. Dr. Lottie, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to being back. Mm -hmm.